Okay, guys, um, thank you for joining us today. I have a really special guest. Um, isn't she lovely? <laughs> <laughs> you will not believe this, but this is uh, a mom to eight, and the oldest is 26. It seems incredible by looking at her. And all the way down to nine-year-old twins, she is a... Um, a pastor to women at Life Austin, right? Life Austin Church. That's right. Texas. She's a, a, a speaker, a writer, an author. And I dug into her book um, when it was released not too long ago. You know what? I receive a lot of books. I receive books probably three or four times a week in the mail. I had a chance to, to visit with Julie Lyles Carr. And she placed this book in my hand kind of shyly. And I took it home and I just thought, this is a transformed book. Oh. A really, really good book. It's called Raising an Original. Um, Julie, will you share with us a little bit about that book and why you wrote it? Well, as a mom of eight, there's a lot of assumption that somehow I've got the mothering thing figured out, which I think is hilarious because it could mean that it just took God eight times for me to start getting some of the message that he was trying to get into my thick head. But you can imagine I get a lot of questions about parenting and, and how we manage eight kids. And one of the things that comes up a lot that's really interesting to me, people are very assumptive that we figured out some kind of system to manage all these kids and we just plug them into our system and we just churn them out. And of course, that's not how it happens at all. <laughs> Each of our kids is so individual. And the longer I've been on this mothering journey, the more awe I have, the more humbled I am, the more it is impressed upon me that every child God places into our lives is so singular. I mean, they're a human being who has never existed before in the history of mankind. And so to really be intentional about seeing that in them and to stop just looking for efficiencies in our parenting, but to really look for those things that make this child individual. There's a passage in the book of Acts when Paul is talking to some people about the gospel. And one of the things that he says to them is that God places every man into specific times, seasons, geographies, all for his specific purpose. And when I really reflect on that verse, and I think about the fact that God placed these kids in our lives, in this place where we live, in this epoch of history, it's just mind blowing. And I wanna make sure I don't miss what he's up to. And I wanna make sure that I'm helping equip my kids and speak into their lives for them to understand the unique call that God has for each one of them. Wow. And, and that's powerful. I think that when you say, you know, this child has never ever been, I mean, this is God's creation. This child is so singular and so uniquely created. Um, it really changes the way I think that we look at our children. And, you know, one of the interesting things that I found in your book was that you described four tangles. And they're really practical. Now, some of you, maybe this will hit one of you. Um, you know, one of these areas might hit you. But for me, it was like, oh, man, I remember that one. Oh, I remember that one. So can you describe those four tangles and share what they look like? I think for us as parents, there are these four tangles that I identify that sometimes keep us from really embracing the originality in our children because we all want to have successful kids, right? And so there are these things that begin to enter our dialogue about parenting that we hope might ensure successful kids but can often really get us snarled into the expectations of our culture. The first tangle that I talk about is the tangle of vocation. We so often start a conversation, even with little bitty kids, by asking them, what do you want to be when you grow up? As if they are not already an R, as if they're not already existing and being who they are. And so we attach very early this conversation about destiny and purpose being associated with a vocation. 
But the reality is when I did a lot of research for the book, I mean, for most of us, we will change careers up to 15 times. And that certainly has been true in my life. I started out in radio and television, but before that I worked in an actual record, actual vinyl record shop, um, you know, worked in everything from a hardware store to putting stickers on medical files, to all kinds of things. We know that's true. And yet, for some reason, we keep thinking with our kids, we're going to help them find the one perfect vocation that is going to fulfill their God destiny. And maybe that might happen for some of them, but that can surely be a tangle because of the different ways that we look at vocation and what we think it means about success. The second tangle that I identify is the tangle of education. Now understand, I love education. My in-laws were both career public educators, both in the classroom, both of them were principals. My dad was born into a very impoverished situation in central Mississippi back in the day, and it was education that led him to his career literally in rocket science, as a rocket scientist. Um, so I believe in education. I think education is powerful, but it's a tool. It is not the thing that speaks and creates our destiny. And so often we get so wrapped up into getting the kids into the exact right school district or picking the exact right educational approach and philosophy or the exact right college. And the reality is kids are gonna change majors on average five times in the course of their college careers. And there was another really alarming statistic that I came across as I was researching this tangle that we parents can get snarled in when we when we want to see the originality in our kids, but we think we're trying to press it through a formula. And that was this statistic that as much as we bemoan that we want American students today to be better versed in the sciences and in math, and you know, as powerful and as great a tool as that can be, when you look at other cultures in which they really are pounding and pushing for those kind of thresholds in their educational systems, for example, in Korea, we're starting to see statistics now that say one in four students at that college level are taking their own lives because of the stress of trying to achieve what is seen as the only means for destiny and purpose, which is to achieve this educational level. To me, that says we need to take a strong step back as believing parents and go, wait a minute, what are we saying to kids and how are we increasing the value of education and trying to oversell the message of education outside of what God's purpose and destiny is? It's a tangle we need to be very cautious of. And then the third tangle, I know we've heard a lot about this. I know we're seeing a lot of this particular phrase, particularly on social media and on media channels, which is, the helicoptering parent. I call it the tangle of bubble wrap. That we so badly want to create these amazing, beautiful, safe, darling childhoods for our children, which is sweet and understandable. And yet, we're really supposed to be preparing them for the launch. And the launch is going to require that they understand how to do hard things, that they need to know how to press in, that they need to understand that the world can be difficult and challenging, and we don't always get to control and choose everything that comes our way. I would rather equip my kids while they're still in my home on how to walk through challenging situations than to curate a childhood for them that is so bump-free, failure-free, challenge-free, that when I set them on the porch of the world, all of a sudden they are completely stunned at what the world really is about. I would much rather prepare them within my home. But that takes being willing to stay out of that tangle of trying to control and protect every single bump and bruise because A, we just can't do it, but B, we're gonna hamstring them if we do. And then the final tangle that I identify is one that I think is really complex in a lot of ways. It's probably the one that takes a lot of willingness to be honest about ourselves. And that is the tangle of our own identity wrapped up in trying to get our kids out there and get them to what their destiny is supposed to be. For a lot of us, if there was something that worked and worked well for us, we want to plug our kids right into that same exact situation, whether that's a vocation or the college we went to or the, you know, the career that we chose. For a lot of us, if there was something that we didn't get to do, or we weren't good at, or we wish that we had taken the opportunity that was out there and we just didn't, we often want to force our kids into that arena and try to get them to live it out because we're still trying to achieve and accomplish and attach a certain success moniker to ourselves. And for a lot of us too, within that particular tangle, that tangle of self, we in a way that can become very unhealthy, 
often want people to see our children as a piece of our identity. So if I have kids who are great and successful and smart and on the dean's list and all that kind of stuff, that it's a reflection of me, of my amazing parenting. Well, you know, and then if I have a kid who's really struggling, we're like, oh, I've got this is father. It wasn't me. <laughs> but I think that we need to disentangle that a bit. You know, our kids are their own people. Do we have strong influence? Absolutely. Are there things that biblically we should be doing to be raising kids in a home of faith? Of course. But at the end of the day, there comes a point where our kids are their own people. And we have to disentangle ourselves from that identity in order for them to launch and launch well. I, I think that looking at those four tangles and untangling those in, in our hearts and our families is actually liberating because you're redefining not only success for your child. This is this is not what success looks like. Success is stepping into who God made you to be. But you're also redefining success to those moms out there who are tied and twisted up and tangled. So yeah. what, does, what do you think success, and even asking this question, I know it's almost like a trick question. If you were to define success over a child in your home, what would that look like? You know, part of what's in Raising an Original is an assessment where parents can take it both for themselves and then alongside their child to really begin to understand their child's personality and, and different personality types and what those things mean and those blends mean. And I think that's a, that's a really powerful tool. But at times it concerns me a little bit that sometimes we take a message of self-discovery and we go no further. We learn something about ourselves as parents, we learn something about our kids, and we stop there. To me, success is when you know who you are, you know that God is the pivot in your life, that those are the decisions and the things that you want to do based on his guidance, and that you take all of that, all of that beauty of knowing who you are in God, knowing who he created you to be, and the confidence that can come with that, and you use that to go out into the world and bless others to make the world a little bit better place. If we stop at this moment, of, oh, I know who I am and therefore I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z, and it's all about our job, our dreams, our whatever, we, we really haven't progressed much, really, <laughs> as a people. Okay. But when we take, go ahead. Very it is very self-focused. Right, right. And, it, and, and I don't ever want us to get stuck there. Success to me, to take that long road around to your question, success to me is if I feel that I can within myself, so I'm able to then model for my kids, understand who God created to me to be, embrace that fully, embrace that from a place of humble gratitude of, wow, I was created in the image of God and I represent this aspect of who he is because God is so variegated. God is all of the personality styles. God is every kind of gift and talent. And I get to represent him in this lane to embrace that fully regardless of what everybody else around me is doing, regardless of what's the most popular Pinterest board. And then to take that and to go find the lane where he wants me to serve, to serve with integrity, to serve with joy, to serve with patience, to serve with long suffering, that to me is success. And if I can communicate that well to my kids and launch them in those directions, it's gonna look different for each of them. But that's success, that's kingdom success. That is, and, and that's why I've been doing this series called Living a Life of Thank You. And we're, mm -hmm. um, we're into the third week of this now. And we've been looking at our junk. You know, we've been looking at our stuff and we've been, um, stepping into an area of living a life of intentional gratitude and this week we transitioned into lord not only do we want you to mess with our heart and help us to shape our children to grow up and tap into those unique um, characteristics that you've placed inside of them and turn around and serve and that's what you are describing exactly so as we end this, there's two things I want to say before we do. One is, please, 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 buy Raising an Original. Um, again, I don't say that lightly. I, I read books daily. This is a game changer. So go pick up Raising an Original. Um, bring it to your mom's group. Bring it to your women's ministries group. And just say, this is something we can go through together. Uh, find out more about Julie. Julie, how can they find out more about you? 
I'd love for them to go to what has been really my family blog scrapbook, and we're trying to reconfigure it to make it look a little more like a grown up. <laughs> but it's julielylescar.com. That's J U L I E L Y L E S car c a r r dot com and you can find all kinds of family pictures and information there and links to the book and then all the social medias same thing julie lyle's car facebook twitter instagram all that fun stuff everywhere. she's just everywhere <laughs> so as we end this there's a mom watching this today and she's feeling like somehow she needs this and i shared with you you know we were both moms um you have eight children from nine years old to 26 and i had three children in 19 months also twins um but three children in 19 months so i early you know early empty nest i had no do-overs I, I wasn't wiser with the third because the third came a minute and a half after number two and so <laughs> I, there were no do-overs for me so there may be a mom out there who's just saying you know what I feel like I've missed this and I am caught up in this tangle. So I want you to give a word of encouragement for her. Then I also want you to end us in prayer by praying for the women that would be watching this. Absolutely. Well, for, for all of us out there who are wanting to do well by our kids, you know, we want to do this parenting thing right. I think that we always have that opportunity to take a pause and to reset and to say, okay, maybe i haven't gotten this right maybe i lost my patience yesterday maybe i've been in a tangle of pushing my own agenda maybe i've been in too much of a tangle of pushing the education piece too hard and god just did not give this kid the math chip okay <laughs> what do i do i tell you i think one of the most validating things we can do for human beings is to be super intentional to say i see you I love the story when Hagar, who is the handmaiden of Sarah and Abraham, and she becomes pregnant with Abraham's child because who thought that was going to be a good idea? And Sarah resents it terribly and sends Hagar out. They fight. She goes out into the desert and she just, she's just done. And yet there she encounters the Lord. And as a result of that encounter, she gives him this incredible nickname that ends up being recorded in the Bible. I mean, this little slave girl knocked up by her boss, HR issues everywhere, hiding out in the desert, and she gets to nickname God. And because of this encounter she has with him and what is communicated to her, she nicknames him El Rai, which means the God who sees me. Jesus emulates this over and over throughout the Gospels where he sees people for who they truly are. So for any mom who's feeling discouraged, can I just tell you one of the most incredible things you can do for your children is simply to be willing to see them and value them and celebrate them for exactly who they are. You will see tangles of your agenda, of the way you were raised, of your culture, of the expectations of your church, all of it. You will see so much of that fall away when you will simply engage that God moment of being El Rai, the one who sees them for exactly who they are. Start there, embrace that, love it, stop fighting it, don't try to fix it, just see who they are and what makes them tick. If we can start there, so many other things will green up when it comes to what we bring to our parenting, when it comes to what we bring to the mom game, and most importantly, when it comes to really equipping and loving these kids well toward the launch. I pray with all of us right now. I love that. It's not, and it's not too late for that. That's right. You know, I remember when my mom began to see me, and I was a grown woman. Yeah. And that impacted my life. That Absolutely. Impacted my life. And so this is for every woman watching this who has the, uh, the role of mom. And so if you'll just pray us out and encourage these women with prayer, that would be amazing. I will. I will. Let us pray. God, we want to do right by these babies you've put into our lives, whether they are babies or 30-year-olds. We want to do right. You've given us such an incredible place of influence. It's really a bit overwhelming in a sense, the kind of voice you've given us to speak into the lives of these people who've never existed before, who are here because you purposed and destined them to be here in this place, in this time, in this season, in this geography. And God, sometimes we feel so 
under-equipped to know what to do about that. Sometimes we respond by being over-controlling. God, help us lay all that down. And would you please remind us by the power of your gentle, sweet Holy Spirit to just take a moment and really look at who you've put into our homes. And then would you give us just a word of knowledge about how to respond to that person you've placed in our homes with agendas and expectations and control and all of that just laid down, just put it down. Would you let us really see your will, your way, and these children you placed into our hearts and our hands and our homes? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Julie. Thanks so much, Susie.